Hey, everybody. Welcome to Odd and Untold, the podcast where we talk about all things strange and spooky. And uh, I'm going to do a shorter episode this week. Uh, it's middle of summer. Uh, vacations are happening. And I'm planning on going on a vacation shortly. So I'm having a pretty busy week. But I wanted to do a show on debunking. Uh, I've been talking about debunking in a lot of the previous episodes. We did an episode last week about Ouija boards. The week prior was a listener submitted story, uh, Gina from Connecticut. So she had some stories that I was doing a little bit of debunking on. And many of our previous episodes, I've sort of talked about how I've gone about trying to debunk things or trying to explain things before jumping to the paranormal conclusion. Uh, and even then, I don't ever say anything is definitely paranormal or definitely a ghost or definitely a UFO. I always try to leave things open uh, to interpretation, to further explanation down the road, or just to the fact that I didn't have all of the facts at the time. So my conclusions are based on what I know or what I've been told. And that's really how we should approach things. So this is going to be a show on the basics of debunking, because I think everybody should sort of start their analysis of anything they experience or anything they hear on TV or from their friends, this is really where you need to start from. And then later in the show, I'm going to sort of talk about how once you've done that, then how do you proceed into a possible paranormal explanation? And again, paranormal can just mean something we don't understand right now. There's supernatural, there's preternatural. I've talked about this on the show before, where preternatural is sort of the things that are natural that we don't understand yet, uh, but we may someday. So things like magnetism, things like uh, breaking the sound barrier, these were all things that at a certain point in time, scientifically were impossible or not understood, and yet now they are. So that's preternatural. And so even when you sort of eliminate rational explanations, known scientific explanations. If you're left with something that's unexplainable, unexplainable doesn't mean paranormal or supernatural necessarily. It just means we don't currently understand it. And maybe one day we will. So I'm going to jump into it. Uh, the, the main premise I'm going to start from here is uh, the philosophical argument of Occam's razor. And I'm not going to get too much into it. One, because this is a show on the basics of debunking. So I'm going to do this from a very high level and not really dig deep into any of this. Uh, I have friends who have been on the show who could probably talk about these things in much more detail, much more eloquently than I, like Josh, like John. Uh, these are very smart guys. These are guys who really understand philosophy and, and spirituality and religion and could explain these things better than I could. But I'm just going to talk about Occam's Razor to start with. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen here just so you guys can uh, see what I am talking about. And I'm going to read a little bit from it. And again, there's this whole article here uh, about William of Occam and how this relates to philosophy and religion and science. And I'm not going to get into all that. I'm just going to go over the basic premise of Occam's Razor, which if you're watching the show, you're probably into the paranormal. If you're into the paranormal, you've probably heard of Occam's Razor before. So let me just go over it briefly. So popularly, the principle is sometimes inaccurately paraphrased as the simplest explanation is usually the best one. Basically, uh, what Occam said is one should prefer the one, the one hypothesis that requires the fewest assumptions. So the fewest assumptions. I'll get into some examples of this. But again, the simplest explanation is usually the best one. And I'm stressing usually here because that's not always the case. And I'll give some examples of that in a bit because simple is the best way to approach it. And I'll give some examples of that, but then I'll show you how that can also not work. Uh, again, if you're going to preternatural things, things we don't understand right now, there may be a much more complicated explanation for things, but I'm going to relate this back to the paranormal and how sometimes we jump to all of these assumptions and, and we get to this paranormal explanation when there's a much simpler explanation that should be looked at first. Uh, so again, the simplest explanation is usually the best one. And 
uh, we should prefer the hypothesis with the fewest assumptions. So let me stop sharing my screen here just so you can see my handsome face. Um, so let's talk about something in the paranormal world and talk about why when and why Occam's razor should be used. So let's talk about Bigfoot, one of my favorite topics to talk about. So what what is the explanation with the fewest assumptions? What is the simplest explanation? So someone says they saw Bigfoot in the woods. What's the simplest explanation? Something natural, something that we know exists. We don't have to make any assumptions. So what is Bigfoot? Bigfoot could be a misidentification. So a bear, a moose, a deer, a tree stump. It could be a guy in a ghillie suit. It could be a guy hoaxing. It could be a person in a gorilla suit. So all of these things are earthbound. They don't take many assumptions. You're making basically one assumption. You're assuming that this was a misidentification. This was, And again, you can get into different misidentifications of what it was. We know bears exist. We know moose exist. We know deer exist. We know tree stumps exist. <laughs> we know people will hoax things. We know people... Hunters will go out in ghillie suits, and this can look like a big, hairy man. So the simplest explanation for all Bigfoot sightings is misidentification. It's just a man in a suit. It's just a bear. It's a tree stump, whatever you want. So that's Occam's razor for you. That's And that's where many skeptics come from. And they just say, you saw a bear. You saw a man in a suit. You saw a tree stump, and you spooked yourself, and you thought it was Bigfoot. So that's you know, Occam's razor in, in practice right there. So let's go to the other side. You're believing in Bigfoot. You're saying, okay, this is Bigfoot. And Bigfoot is a mystical being that travels through portals or is dropped off here by aliens. Now you're talking about many more assumptions. You're talking about, okay, I saw Bigfoot. So what is Bigfoot? what is the first assumption? The first assumption is that Bigfoot exists. So you have this eight foot to 10 foot tall, hairy, humanoid, bipedal creature. So that's first assumption. Okay. Second assumption is that it's from another dimension. That's where it comes from. The third assumption, if you're assuming that, is that other dimensions exist, which we don't know. So you're assuming that parallel dimensions or alternate dimensions exist. Fourth assumption, you're assuming that these creatures can somehow move between these dimensions. A fifth assumption, if you want to keep going there, because some people will say that they have this ability, that these creatures now can manipulate these portals. They can use them at will and move between their dimension and our dimension. So already you're seeing, you know, on the one hand, you have, you know, one assumption. This is a misidentification of a bear. On the other hand, now you're up to five, six, seven assumptions that this has to exist and that has to exist and they know how to do this and this is why they're coming here. So you're getting into many different assumptions. Are they, you know, is it possible? Of course, anything is possible. But the simpler explanation is probably the correct one. If someone's in the woods and sees something, they're probably seeing a fleeting glimpse of a bear or a man in a ghillie suit or something that startled them and their perception is wrong, that is much more likely, not 100%, but much more likely than this portal-hopping, bipedal, hairy, undiscovered, ape-like person who jumps through portals. It's just a simpler explanation is the better one, uh, because we can prove it. We can prove that portals exist. Again, doesn't mean it is not possible, or that it's not the case. Who knows? I mean, there's a lot of stuff about Bigfoot that we don't know, and maybe that is the case. Now, to kind of go in the middle there, with not as many assumptions, but more than the misidentification, if you're saying Bigfoot is just an undiscovered primate, you're not making that many assumptions. You're saying, okay, one, Bigfoot exists. You saw something. So again, both premises, you're saying you saw something, but the assumption is that a undiscovered primate exists, and that is escaped detection. So more assumptions than just that it's a bear, but not as many as like it's jumping through portals or aliens are bringing it down. Because again, if you're saying it's aliens, now you have to assume that alien life exists. You have to assume that they 
have the technology to travel here. You have to assume that they have a reason for coming here. They have a reason for dropping off these Bigfoot creatures. So again, you're getting into many, many, many more assumptions that you don't really have to make if you assume that it's just a primate or it's just a misidentification. So you kind of have this bell curve of uh, or this exponential uh, increase in assumptions that you're making the further away you get from reality. And this is why a lot of people just believe that if Bigfoot exists, it's just a primate. There's fewer assumptions. I mean, there's still more than if you say it doesn't exist and they're all just misidentifications, but fewer assumptions. Again, if you want to get into the paranormal and ghosts, uh, you know, if you hear footsteps in your house, you can say it's the house settling. It's the wind. It's a natural phenomenon making this sound that sounds like footsteps. That is the fewest assumptions. You're not assuming anything, really. You're saying, you know, well, as aside from that, it's nature. It's just temperature changes causing the house to settle or it's wind causing the house to creak. If you believe it's a ghost, now you're making some more assumptions. You're assuming that there is an afterlife. The afterlife exists. You're assuming that anything in the afterlife can now affect the real world. And you're assuming that these entities in the afterlife that can affect the real world are now in your house. So again, you start seeing the assumptions start piling up. And I wanted to just sort of relate this back to the past couple of episodes, just because they're fresh in my mind. And um, the first one I want to talk about is Gina's story from Connecticut, because she had a lot of stories about stuff she was experiencing as she was waking up. And a lot of it sounded like sleep paralysis. And I said many times during the episode that I'm not discounting her story. I don't want to invalidate her experiences, but from a skeptical point of view, from a, an Occam's razor point of view, you have to assume that that is sleep paralysis. It sounds like sleep paralysis. She was waking up. She was seeing things. She felt uh, paralyzed. She couldn't move. And she was seeing like really freaky things, but she was always being woken up. So the assumption, the, the, the fewer assumptions, you know, the point of fewer assumptions is that she was just waking up from a bad dream and her body hadn't really caught up to her brain yet. So her brain was conscious, but she was still kind of dreaming and her body couldn't move. And she was kind of trapped between these two states of consciousness, which we know happens. We have scientifically empirically proved that. So that's where we come from from there. And that's why I mentioned it, because it is the fewest of assumptions. If you want to believe it's paranormal, you have to assume that, again, the afterlife exists, that there are entities in the afterlife, that these entities can enter our world and affect our world, and that it's not even just the afterlife, because some of these things that she were seeing were sort of demonic in appearance. I mean, there was like a goat man that she was seeing with, you know, the, the torso of a person and the, the legs of a goat. And, uh, so that's not the ghost of grandma, you know, that sounds like something demonic or inhuman. So again, you have to make all these assumptions. Does it mean it wasn't paranormal? Does it mean demons don't exist? No, but the simpler explanation makes a lot more sense that she was just, you know, encountering some sleep paralysis, which I've had. I know people who've had it. So that's really where we have to proceed from with that. Now, to touch on last week's episode with the Ouija board, where John and I were talking about some of our experiences, we talked about debunking certain things. And I'll just pick one example. And it was the scratches on my back. I woke up one day, I had scratches on my back. And we talk in the episode about us trying to debunk this, where I went to my friends, I showed them the scratches, and we were talking about it. Like, I don't have any, I didn't have any pets. You know, at the time I'm saying, I don't have any pets here. Like, there's no cat, there's no dog. So an animal didn't scratch me. I wasn't, you know, horsing around or roughhousing with my brothers. So they didn't scratch me. All I did was go home and went to bed. And, you know, my bed is a, a mattress with sheets. I mean, it's not like I'm lying on nails or glass. Like, what scratched me? Um, I didn't interact with anybody. I didn't get into a fight. So we eliminated all of those options. It wasn't an animal. It wasn't another person. Uh, 
I was trying to like reach certain places where I was scratched and I couldn't do it while I was awake. Uh, so it was very difficult to, for me to reach just my big gangly arms here. I'm a tall guy. I'm like six one. So there are certain places on my back that I cannot touch and scratch. So again, we were trying to debunk this. So if it wasn't an animal or a pet, it wasn't another person. It wasn't any of my brothers. It wasn't any of my friends. Uh, I didn't get into a fight. It wasn't my bed because there's nothing sharp in most people's beds. Uh, and we pretty much eliminated me because even while awake, you know, really trying to hit these places, I, my fingers wouldn't reach. So now we're starting to eliminate things. Um, are, are there possibilities? Yes. I mean, maybe there was something in my bed that I was rolling over on and it was scratching me and I woke up in the morning and it fell on the floor and rolled under my bed and I just never saw it. Very possible. Um, but how likely? So, uh, you know, we were trying to debunk that. Uh, maybe there is some natural explanation for it. Maybe I was scratching myself in my sleep. Maybe in my sleep, I was able to reach these places where I couldn't while I was awake and scratched myself. I don't know. Maybe it was bug, bug bites. I, I, you know, but they were long scratches. So who knows? But we tried to debunk it. We tried to, you know, eliminate certain possibilities. And what we were left with was not that we were saying we summoned a demon, not that a demon came into my bedroom and scratched me. Again, these are lots of assumptions. We just got to a point where we couldn't really explain it. Like, why did I have these scratches? It's unexplainable, not necessarily paranormal. So I don't want to ever jump to that as a definite is it a possibility? It's just as possible as something sharp being in my bed at this point, you know, because again, I don't know if I have all the facts. I don't know. Maybe somebody broke into my house that night and dragged a knife along my back while I was in a deep sleep and then crawled back out the window and shut it behind them. And it, that is more possible and probable than a demon scratching me. How likely is it? I don't know. So I really don't know. But it's one of these things where anytime something like this happens, we do try to debunk and we should, and you should as well. If you have this experience, any experience that's like paranormal or weird, it's important to try to debunk it and say, what could it be versus jumping to the paranormal conclusion? Because that uh, is irresponsible. And my whole thing is I'm looking for the truth and I'd rather... <laughs> I'd rather a boring truth than an interesting lie. So I'd rather, you know, have an explanation and know what that was and say, oh, okay, that UFO I saw was just, uh, you know, a, a U.S. experimental aircraft from the U.S. military. Uh, rather than thinking, oh, I, I saw aliens, I saw aliens, and believing this sort of sensational lie when it really wasn't, I'm just kind of fooling myself and fooling everybody else I'm talking to. So I always leave that room for interpretation. I always leave that door open that I don't have all the facts. I don't have all the sensory information to make that determination. All I can talk about is that moment in time that I experienced it, what I saw, what I felt. So again, you can apply that to UFOs. Again, the, 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 mo the simplest explanation is that this is an experimental aircraft. You know, you see something in the sky and we know the government test flies things. We know that they have technology they haven't told us about yet. I grew up, you know, in the 80s, I grew up with stealth technology and people were talking about this and skeptics, we don't have stealth, but the government was testing stealth technology and then it comes out. So when you see these UFOs and you see these, you know, I to, to jump to alien, you're making many more assumptions. Again, you're assuming that alien life exists in the universe. You're assuming that they have the technology to get here from very far away. You're assuming that there's a reason why they'd want to come here. You're assuming that they're coming here and trying to be discreet about it. And, you know, they're coming all the way here and not making contact with us aside from just flying through our atmosphere and being seen occasionally. So again, your, your assumptions start really piling up uh, so the, the Occam's razor says the simplest explanation, it's an unidentified human terrestrial aircraft. That's 
the simplest explanation. Is it the real explanation? We don't know. And these UAP hearings recently suggest that possibly uh, we're wrong about that, that maybe these are alien. Uh, Maybe these are non-terrestrial entities visiting us. And that is fascinating and interesting. Again, there's no proof, but uh, things are happening. So it's very possible. And, uh, you know, I, I mentioned earlier about how the science can change. We always talk about that. The science changes and it does. You go back a thousand years, they didn't understand what magnetism was. So what was the simplest explanation? Magic. You know, it's just, uh, you know, someone in their shop could like have a magnet under the desk and move another piece of metal and people say, oh, it's magic. They didn't understand positive and negative charged ions and electrons and, and the attraction between those two things. We only really started understanding magnetism in the 20th century. So, you know, early 20th century. So you think about all of human existence where we knew magnets existed. We just didn't know what they were. Same thing for an eclipse. It's the dragon eating the moon or where does the sun go at night or the earth is flat or where the center of the universe and everything revolves around us. The science always changes. Those were the simplest explanations at the time, but it turned out that the more complex explanation was actually true. So again, you always want to start. That's where you start when you debunk. You start with the simplest explanation. And I'm going to move this into another interesting point about how we get to the paranormal or the unexplained. Uh, But you want to have your baseline start with Occam's razor. The simplest, look for the simplest explanation. If that explains it, you kind of have to leave it there. And that's, I'll, I'll take that back to Gina's stories where she was having what sounds like sleep paralysis. So for those particular stories, and I said this during the episode, those particular stories, I tend to throw them out. Even with me, I've had many weird things happen for me when I'm like in a waking state. When I wake up, I'll hear my bell ring or I hear voices and I wake up. I don't talk about those stories. I never tell them to anybody. They're weird, but I throw them out because I say it's probably a dream. It's probably a waking dream or sleep paralysis or sleepwalking or, you know, some amalgamation of that. So to me, I have to debunk them until I have more information, but we know that sleep paralysis happens. And this sounds exactly like sleep paralysis. So if it looks like a duck and walks like a duck, it's a duck. And if it, sounds like sleep paralysis it's probably sleep paralysis so that's where we always start from and that's where you have to debunk and if you can't explain it again if you're seeing bigfoot in a distance bigfoot and you just kind of see this big thing for a split second and it's dark and hairy and you're seeing it from 100 yards or 200 yards you're not getting a lot of detail it's most likely a bear or another animal or a guy in a ghillie suit or just, you know, your vision playing tricks on you. A good example of this is uh, in an early episode, Josh and I were talking about an encounter we had in the Adirondacks at Ross Pond, Bigfoot or Bear. That was the name of the episode, you know, because we were trying to figure out what was this. And some of what we experienced didn't seem to fit with a bear. It just seemed too tall it wasn't easily scared off. It didn't go after our food. There were aspects of it that said to us, it's not a bear. But in the absence of actually seeing it, all we saw was the eye shine. We heard it moving, so we knew it was big. Uh, but we didn't have enough evidence to say it was Bigfoot. So what do we say? It was a bear. It was probably a bear, maybe a very large bear. Maybe our perceptions were off. Maybe we thought it was further away than we thought. So maybe it wasn't as tall as we thought. So we throw it out as saying, was that a Bigfoot experience? To me, I can't say it was because the simpler explanation is that it was a bear. So even with my own stuff, I will debunk it. And I actually just put a video up on YouTube a few weeks ago, uh, which shows us the next morning uh, trying to debunk or just figure out what we saw. And then we found a footprint. And we got all excited because it looked like a Bigfoot footprint. And then when we got home and reviewed the footage, we realized that it was a bear track that I had kind of stepped in and made it look like this very large, you know, stereotypical Bigfoot track. 
but we debunked it. And like I said, I would rather have that out there than to sensationalize a lie and say, oh, look, we found Bigfoot and, you know, we got this, this track and, you know, click, like, comment, subscribe, you know. I don't want that. I'd rather have the truth, the boring truth, where it's just me stepping in a bear print rather than a sensational lie. So always proceed from Occam's razor. But I'm going to get into how we get to the paranormal next. Okay, so up on the screen now is a quote from one of my favorite authors. So this is Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, and he wrote famously the uh, Sherlock Holmes series. And this is a quote from one of the Sherlock Holmes stories. And it's always struck me just as a paranormal investigator, as someone into the paranormal and the supernatural, someone who's always tried to debunk things. Um, but this is kind of the other side of Occam's razor. So you proceed, you start at Occam's razor. That's your starting point. You say, let me try to explain this in the simplest way possible with the fewest assumptions. That's probably what it is. The issue with that is that sometimes you can't explain things. So I'm going to read this quote. Once you eliminate the impossible, whatever remains, no matter how improbable, must be the truth. So I'm going to link to this and you guys can find this online and make your own interpretations of this. But if you really think about that, once you eliminate the impossible, whatever remains, no matter how improbable, must be the truth. So as I was talking about earlier, and I'll just use the same example of the scratches on my back. It's that process of elimination. You know, if if I had scratches on my back and, uh, you know, I said, oh, you know what, though? Yesterday I was kind of, you know, wrestling with my brothers and we were having fun and, you know, we're out in the yard and we're just wrestling and rolling around on the ground. Uh, that's probably where the scratches came from. I don't remember being scratched. It didn't hurt at the time, but we all have had that. We've all, you know, woke up one morning and there's a bruise on our leg or there's a scratch. And just in the normal course of our day, we bump into things and. At the time, you don't really remember it. It doesn't feel like it's going to bruise or scratch. And then the next day you have a scratch. And I, you know, I have like scratches. I don't know if you can see that on camera, but I have like a scratch on my wrist right now. I don't even know how I got that, but it's like a scratch on my wrist, but it's a little scratch. I mean, I could have gotten it from just, you know, reaching for something and not realizing at the time. Uh, but the scratches on my back were numerous and just like three, there was always like three in a direction. So, you know we started eliminating things. So do I have any pets? No, I have no pets. Were, was I, you know, wrestling with my brothers? No, I was not. I was not doing anything, anything physical. You know, I was kind of at uh, our friend's house the day before, and then I went home and slept and I went back to my friend's house the next day. So I, I you know, wasn't doing anything physical. Uh, was there anything in my bed? I checked my bed, there, you know, and I slept in my bed and I don't keep anything sharp in my bed that would have scratched me in such a way. So it, it, it's really eliminating those things. And I'll bring this back again to my favorite topic of Bigfoot. And, you know, skeptics will always say, you saw a bear slash deer slash moose slash guy in a ghillie suit. So how do we use this quote from Sherlock Holmes, eliminating things to reach the improbable conclusion that must be true? How do we do that? So let's go back to a Bigfoot encounter. So you have someone who says they see Bigfoot. Okay, you saw a bear. Well, no. <laughs> the Bigfoot I saw was standing upright, and it was moving its arms, and it had a human face, and it was nine feet tall, and it had a deer slung over its shoulder, and it roared at me. So now you're, you're, you're getting more details here, and you're saying, okay, well, a bear can stand upright. They can't really walk very far, more than a couple of steps. So if someone says they saw Bigfoot walking, this bipedal creature walking, for many, many steps, you know, feet or yards or crossing a road. Bears can't really do that. They can stand up to kind of reach things and they can take a step or two to kind of keep their balance. And, you know, trained bears at a circus can do a little bit more, but bears in the wild don't really do that. So you have a witness who says a bear, you know, ran across the road, five, six steps walking across the road, carrying a deer over its shoulder. A bear is not going to do that. Uh, you know, man in a ghillie suit's not going to do that. A man in a ghillie suit's not going to be eight feet tall, nine feet tall. And again, I'm talking up close sort of things. And, and this all goes back to a personal truth. When we witness things, when we experience things, 
we don't have the proof. If you don't have a photo, if you don't have video, if you don't have the body of the, the Bigfoot that you're seeing, you know, you can't bring him down to the, to the local university and say, Hey, here's the guy I saw. And he's like, I'm Bigfoot. How do you prove it? You know, this, you're just going off eyewitness testimony. So again, a lot of this is just for your, yourself to how do you debunk what you saw, what you experienced? How do you get to the truth? So if you have seen this creature, you know that it's eight, nine feet tall because you can tell which branch it's hitting or how much bigger it is than you because you were up close to it. It had a deer slung over its shoulder or it picked up a stick and banged it on a tree or threw a rock at you. If you have these details and you can eliminate, okay, that's not a bear, clearly not a bear because a bear can't do those things, clearly not a moose or a deer or any other animal of that sort because they never go up on two, you know, two legs and they're clearly deers or moose or ungulates not a man in a ghillie suit because a man in a ghillie suit is not going to be eight nine feet tall not going to be able to walk with a deer over his shoulder in the ghillie suit um so you can start eliminating those as possibilities and that's really where you start getting to what was this uh same thing with the paranormal if you hear a voice in your home you start that process you say okay well maybe maybe it was a neighbor maybe it was somebody else in the house but you can start doing those eliminations you can say well i live in a house where my closest neighbor is half a mile away or down the block you know like the houses aren't connected so they would have to be screaming for me to even have the faintest little hint of hearing their voice and this was a very clear voice in the next room so you eliminate neighbors or outside noise okay maybe it's someone in the house well no i'm alone <laughs> my whole family is uh in florida for a vacation and i had to work so I'm, I'm home by myself in this house so there's no one else in the house maybe it's an intruder you know you can go through the house and look and every door is locked every window is locked and closed it, there's no intruder there's no way an intruder could get out in the mere seconds between you hearing the voice and you investigating so as you can see you can start eliminating possibilities it's not outside noise from a neighbor or a person it's not coming from a family member a roommate anybody else who lives in the house it's not coming from an intruder all your tvs are off all your radios are off so you start eliminating these things and then you start getting towards the truth and a possible paranormal uh explanation you don't want to jump to the paranormal. It becomes, for me, it becomes an interesting story. You can tell this at parties. You can say, hey, this weird thing happened to me. I don't know if it was a ghost. I don't know if it was a demon. I don't know if it was an alien in my house. I don't know if it was Bigfoot knocking on my door. You don't know. It's just you've eliminated all other possibilities. So whatever remains must be true. I don't go that far as far as saying that it must be paranormal. It could be something we don't understand. Again, maybe there's just echoes from the past that the earth replays once in a while and voices just get picked up and we hear them like a tape recorder just going off. And is that paranormal? Is that a ghost? No, it's just something we don't understand yet that happens naturally, like an earthquake or anything like that, you know, tornadoes, you can't, you know, you can't necessarily predict when a tornado is going to hit. I mean, even when you have a tornado warning, it doesn't always touch down. It doesn't always happen. It's just the conditions are right. So there's still many things in nature that we cannot really predict with a hundred percent accuracy. We can predict with a good amount of accuracy or it, it may happen, but we don't know. So maybe these voices are just you know, echoes from the past. And it's not about the afterlife. It's not about a ghost. It's not about being haunted. It's just a sound. It's just something being replayed that we can hear. So that is, is a good explanation because you've eliminated so many other things that it could be. And again, same thing with UFOs. You can say, well, was that an experimental aircraft? You know, you're seeing a light in the sky and it's doing weird things. That could be your perception, but you have something land in your yard you get a better look at it, you can start eliminating that this is human or this is terrestrial. And again, to go back to personal truths, you know, we, we all have them. We all have things that are personal to us, things that we know a hundred percent for sure that we can never, ever prove. And I want to get Josh on the show to talk about this because he did mention it um, 
I believe in the last episode he was on, but he's much more eloquent and articulate about talking about this stuff than I am. But it, it's, it's basically just comes down to personal truths and belief. And the example he gave was prove to me that you love your children. You can't. You can't empirically, scientifically prove that you love your children. You can say, well, I buy them things and I hug them every night. And I could pick up a doll and put a bottle in its mouth and I could hug it. It doesn't mean I love it. So this is internal to you. You know, prove how much you were grieving when your grandmother died. You can't prove that empirically. It's just your personal truth. You feel it. You experience it. But it's not something you can assign a number to. It's not something you can scientifically prove or gauge. And you may, f you know, feel a tremendous amount of guilt when, you know, or grief when your grandmother dies and then your grandfather can die and maybe it doesn't hit you as hard or maybe it hits you harder. And, you know, we all have these experiences with who we love, who we feel jealous of. I mean, emotions and feelings are just things that exist that we cannot really empirically prove exists. So it's your own truth. And that's what I'm talking about. If you have these experiences, try approaching it from Occam's razor. Start at that point and say, can I debunk this? Can I say it was probably this? And if, if yes, if you say, well, I was woken up and I couldn't move and I saw this weird demon in the corner of my room, could that be sleep paralysis? Well, yeah, I woke up. I couldn't move. It sounds like sleep paralysis. It feel, felt like sleep paralysis. It probably was sleep paralysis. Probably. And I'm again, I'm using very open terms here. Probably and, and likely and probable. And that's where we have to proceed from is that. So again, I'm not dis dismissing Gina's experiences. I'm not saying they weren't paranormal. I'm just saying as an outsider looking in, I have to say that sounds like sleep paralysis. So those stories I'm going to kind of put on the back shelf and say, those aren't as interesting to me as the stories she mentioned where she was wide awake and she was with a friend and she and her friend both experienced something that is independently corroborated where they both saw something or both heard something. So stories like that always fascinate me more because you have an independent witness. You can't just say this was a hallucination or a trick of your eye or a misidentification if two people are now seeing it or, or experiencing it. So you always want to proceed from Occam's razor, start with the simplest explanation. And if you can go with that, you have to, you can still tell your story. You can still say it's interesting, but it was probably this. Um, if you eliminate those things, now it becomes a much more interesting story because you can say, yeah, I had this experience, but I was alone in the house and nobody else was there. And once you eliminate those objections from skeptics where they say, oh, it was probably just this. And you say, well, no, it couldn't be that because of this reason. And I've had that a lot where, you know, you tell a story and people say, ah, maybe it was just this person coming in and like, well, no, the house was locked. You know, we were there by ourselves. Nobody knew we were there. Blah, blah, blah. You can start going down that route and start shooting down the explanations. And once you run out of explanations, you eliminate the impossible, whatever's left, however improbable must be the truth. And I'm not saying that's ever aliens or ghosts or Bigfoot. It's just unexplained. What was it? It wasn't a bear. It wasn't a moose. It wasn't a deer. It wasn't a man in a suit. What was it? That's where you get to the interesting parts. And that's where you're saying, okay, it could have been Bigfoot because you can't say it was a bear. It clearly wasn't a bear. It clearly wasn't a moose. It clearly wasn't a man in a suit. What else is there? Bigfoot now becomes a strong possibility, not a definite, not an absolute, just that possibility. So I hope this has been helpful. <laughs> I hope I've articulated this well. Start with Occam's razor, start just simple explanation, see if that works. If you can eliminate those, now you're kind of getting into, okay, well, every rational explanation, every simple explanation doesn't really work to explain this. So what am I left with? I'm left with this is an unexplainable, unexplained experience. It's odd. It's hopefully told once you tell me your story. And if you do want to tell me your story, Jason at odd and untold .com. Shoot me an email. Happy to share your story. If you want to just write it out for me, I'll read it on air. If you want to come on the show, you can come on the show. I can keep you anonymous. Or if you want to show your face, that's fine too. Love having you guys on. Love all your stories. 
Uh, if you're listening or watching on YouTube, please like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. It really helps the channel. I hate doing that. Like, comment, subscribe, like, comment, subscribe. It does help me out though. So uh, if you're listening on audio podcast, Apple, Spotify, iHeartRadio, any of those good places, leave us a review, any amount of stars you think we deserve. It really helps the channel. Just be fair. And uh, if you have criticism, constructive criticism, I'd like to hear it. So you can always email me again, jason at autonuntold.com or just in your review. So until next time, everybody, hope you have a great summer. I'll be on vacation, but I will be back next week, hopefully with a new show. And uh, until then, rock and roll, everybody. <laughs>